I was sentenced to 16 years to life and um, for second degree murder. I started my time about 91. Um, my case, my crime was actually committed in 89, but I was out on bail, this and that, uh, in the county. So my time actually started in February 1991. I had a lifestyle that was, you know, just crazy. So once I went to the hole, um, during that time, it allowed me that break to just read things like that. Because during the time you're in the hole, you're pretty much in solitary confinement, you know, isolation. So pretty much the only thing you're going to be doing is either writing letters or uh, reading. Mm -hmm. So during that time, I started requesting books. I knew I was going to be doing some reading, so I started asking the guys on the tier, as they call it, you know, uh, where, where we live. You know, you kind of like shouting out of the cell block, you know, asking for books or whatever. And so um, I ended up with an almanac, a world almanac. And in the world almanac, it had a section on religion. So I said, you know what, I'm going to just read that. Because I was in search. I was actually, I went to the hole, I messed up. You know, I said, man, let me try to get myself right. Let me look at some things, right, reassess some things. Um, so when I started reading the different religions, Judaism, Hinduism, Buddhism, I was reading all these different things. When I got to Islam, uh, as I read that whole section, it kind of broke down the pillars. It talked about um, uh, different, uh, the articles of faith and things like that. And it really was attractive. It made sense, it seemed practical. So after I completed reading this, I said, this is it. So I immediately got up and went to my cell door and started yelling out the tear, telling the staff, you know, uh, the, the, the state, you know, workers, that I need a Quran. After I got maybe to the first, through the first couple of chapters, halfway through Surah Baqarah, or Surah, the second chapter of the Quran, I knew I was gonna be Muslim. I just got up and I yelled out the tear, cause it was a few guys I'd been communicating with on the tear there. I said, from here on out, I'm a Muslim. Just so y'all know, I'm a Muslim. And they was like, okay, whatever, you know. I was, um in a prison in Kalinga. So now, now that I'm here in this hellhole, I'm like at the bottom of the ladder of life. And I need to find something that's gonna uplift me, I guess. That's what it was. Allah finally debased me enough to the point to where now, you're at the point to where you're gonna hear me. When you find something and you feel that it's for real and you try to be serious, you, you do it the best you can. So that's what happened with me. And so I took Shahada, Alhamdulillah, 1998. You know, it was a trip. The journey was for me was real good because I had been reading all these books. I had accumulated, you know, I had read the entire uh, volumes of uh, Bukhari. I went through each volume. I was on the quest for knowledge. I just wanted knowledge. So every day I would try to seek out the brothers that I knew that was there, the inmates, the, from among the Muslim inmates, and ask them for knowledge. You know, whatever they had, if it was learning the prayer, if it was the Arabic, uh, whatever it was, I was like, you know, give it to me. Give me some books to go back with. A year later, okay. Yusuf showed up on the yard. And then that time, he really introduced us into studying fiqh. He was the one that really said, look, you know, we, there's more to Islam than just, you know, the five pillars. So that's when we started, really started, we set up this learning jamaat and we started to educate each other. You know, I felt like it was important that I teach the Muslims that were there, that would come in contact with, so that when they get out and go to their families and go to their community, you know, they have something to offer. Or even if it's just themselves being, you know, sound. We wrote to a whole bunch of organizations, a whole bunch of massages all over, and no one would answer us. Then we got a, we did get a letter back from Zaytuna. Actually, I was with Brother Yusuf when we got that letter back and everything. So, you know, alhamdulillah. You know, me and Yusuf sat for many, many, many nights together talking about, man, when we get out, we're gonna do this, we're gonna do that. And, but, you know, he had life and I was getting out. And I actually got out in 2002. 
So right up to the time that I was leaving, he was just like, brother, Yusuf used to say, you're the first one from our little Jamaat that's going to get out. Uh, and Saudi, I had been telling him before he had got out, before he had paroled, make sure that he goes to Zaytuna. You know, brother, make sure you get down to Zaytuna and, um, and f find the brothers. That's basically what I said, find the brothers, I, you know. Now, we saw brothers come, we saw brothers come and go. We saw brothers, Muslims, leave us from that prison and say, oh, yeah, brother, when I get out, man, I'm going to put, you know, they knew our dilemma that we didn't have no outside contact with a lot of the massage. So we was always, we were seeking this knowledge, man. We was hungry for this knowledge, and we couldn't get it from nobody. And so, like, all these brothers that get out, they were like, yeah, man, I, yeah, I'm going to go to this place, and I'm going to hook you guys up. I'm going to have people come back in here and write you and, and, and get you the material that you need. And, and we said, okay, and we all these empty promises. You know, the brothers got out, nothing ever happened. So Yusuf told me that, look, man, the core out of the core, I was the first one from the core to get out. And he just said, brother, it's up to you now. And I'm like, inshallah, man, I'm not going to let us down, you know. And then I got out. I would have to say that the beginnings of Tayba started um, back in 2002. And it was, I met a brother named Ansari Greenwell. And he was, he was in prison. And he came out and he was studying. He was a group of, of dedicated students within the prison. They didn't have many resources, but whatever they had, whatever Arabic books, books on usul, books on fiqh, books on aqidah, they were studying them and really soaking them up. I said, hey, Rami, you know, there's this brother, man, that I was in prison with, named Yusuf, man. Look, he, he's, he's like the alum for us in there. And, I, and what happened was I had this little fig book this little book that I took notes with. And when I got out and was, got to know Rami and everything, and then one day I was studying, I was going through my book, and I was like, oh yeah, what's the deal, what's the Delil on that shit? You know, I used to tell Rami, what's the Delil on that? And, and he was like, what's that book you got? And I was like, oh, these are just some notes. And then he looked, he went through my book, and he was like, where did you learn this? He was amazed. I was like, man, we learned that, I learned that in prison. He was like, what? He couldn't believe it that we, this extensive little book of fic that I had. And he's like, man, you taught it. And I said, yeah, man. I said, I was with, I'm telling you, I'm with this brother named Yusuf. And we learned, we taught each other this. And that's how, then I said, look, you really need to help this brother further his quest for sacred knowledge. So then he comes to tell me there's a brother named Yusuf Wiley uh, who's in prison. He's leading a number of, of halaqas and teaching. So based on his questions, I said, this brother needs to, needs, needs to further his studies and, and, have a, and have access to a teacher. So I started teaching Yusuf in 2002 through collect phone calls, um, really uh, that I would pay out of my own. Uh, it wasn't associated with any organization. So we kept that up for a number of years, and we, we studied um, uh, a number of texts. Um, the uh, introduction uh, of introductory fiqh through Ibn Ashir and Akhdari, the purification of the heart, Matarat al Qulub by Muhammad Mawlud, the prohibitions of the tongue by Muhammad Mawlud, the Ejrumiyya in Arabic grammar, um, a number of other texts by Muhammad Mawlud, the, the rights of the parents, um, the, the poem of reflection, the adab of the student by Imam al Zarnuji, um, also Mustalah al Hadith, al Bayquniyya, the studies in Usul. And, uh, and all of this, and, 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 and along with this, also he's asking questions and I'm you know, responding to the questions. And so it's building up his, uh, his, his studies. And then he turns around directly and starts teaching other people. And so then we, we, we founded uh, Tayba Foundation in 2008 uh, to, as an educational and charitable organization to continue this. By that time he had gotten the, he had, got, he had studied all of his Fard Ain to where uh, at mastery level, and uh, and even fard kifaya sciences, and he was busy in, in in teaching other people, also in his rehabilitation programs, and then in his own fight to get in his own legal battle to get uh, out of prison. When he um, when he went up for the board review, and we were wa waiting for the response. This was in uh, December, I believe it was the 21st. I, I saw some emails, and I was looking at some other uh, uh, some other emails. And uh, I had just passed by the email on my phone from the Governor Legal Affairs Office. 
and then I clicked on it, and this is basically going to say like whether we've denied his parole or not, which means another two, three, four, five years, and this process has to start again. So I looked at it, and it said the governor has this, uh, has denied to review the case, which means he's he's free. But as I'm reading it. I'm saying, am I reading it right? Am I reading it wrong? And so I went over and I, and I looked at it and it said, you know, I, uh, it finally hit me that, okay, he's going to be free. And I went and uh, I, I immediately went and I prayed Salat to shukr And when I, I remember clearly having my forehead on the ground, you know, and at that, and it was a, it was a sajda that I've been waiting for for years to be able to, you know, to thank Allah for, for, what, he, for what he has done for us. It's just, yeah, it can't, it's no words for it. It's really no words for it. Yeah, it, it's no words for it, you know what I mean? I think that uh, once I sleep and wake up, make sure I don't wake up inside Avenal State Prison. <laughs> no, you're you know gonna beat you right here, man. <laughs> How does it feel to look like out at a, a big green field and know, know that you're huh? not in a I know, huh? no no well, grass there's some, period. There's some barber well, barbed wire right there though know, razor okay. wire grass though we didn't have you grass. didn't have grass we didn't have grass we only had dirt wow so how long has it been since you've seen grass it's been a while how about trees it's been a long long while trees yeah I wanted to touch some trees too when I was over in the van when before did they let you no I I didn't get a chance to get out. Yeah. That's the red one. They have a smell? Not really, huh? Good. Yusuf made a, a, a vow. He, he, he made a vow with Allah. He said, uh, he, told, he later told me this, but he made a vow with Allah that uh, he said, Oh, God, if you re get me out of prison, release me from prison, I will dedicate myself to serving the community every single day and he means the community humanity not just the Muslim community but the human community every single day so since he's been out it's uh, he's been involved in a number of projects and with us he, he dedicates a lot of time helping the Teva Foundation in our distance education course because there's a lot of other Yusufs out there and there's a lot of other potential and there's uh, one thing that always amazes me about um, the prisoners the inmates is the amount of potential that they have and you know we see uh, whether it's questions of fiqh or understanding of tafsir, uh, Arabic. You know we get uh, I, I see their work in Arabic and they're writing in Arabic and they're all doing this in the confines of prison and with extreme limited, uh, uh, extremely limited resources. So what we want to do is replicate the, the model. So where, whereas it uh, previously was myself, one person, teaching one student or two or three students, we want to be able to have a team of teachers teaching hundreds of students. A promise is big in Islam. So if you didn't do something, 
and you didn't rectify, you just let the weeks go by. You know what, I never took mine to the store that day and blah, blah, blah. Did you ever call mine and say, you know what, I apologize. I know I promised to take you to the store last week and I didn't even get around to it. You gotta make time for that. You, you asked about the, the, the letters and can one person handle it. And really when you open a letter from, from, a, from an inmate, it's not really just read the letter, respond to them, uh, you're, you're opening in to the life of a human being. And a life of a human being that really feels forgotten. A lot of the Muslim inmates feel forgotten um, in the Muslim community. They identify themselves as part of the greater Ummah, but they, they, don't have, uh, they don't have a connection to them. You know, even if they send out mail to organizations, those organizations in Masajid, if they, especially if they don't have a prison outreach uh, program, they're not able to, to respond. So you're getting a person that's been writing for, for years and years and not getting a response. The Muslims didn't embrace them. So they wrote that masjid in their neighborhood that they was paroling to, but that masjid didn't write them back. So going in there now, hey, y'all didn't get my letter? You know, they not, see what I'm saying? There's this distance, this, this disconnect. Because you can see we just get stacks and stacks of letters and each one is going to involve a lot of uh, care and concern because if they don't, if they don't get a response, then it's as if they feel, well, just one more time, here's another organization we've written, and they haven't, um, they haven't uh, written back to us. So uh, when, I, uh, when I read the mail every Friday, and we set up all of the, the mail to be responded to starting on Monday, um, so when I'm sitting there at my desk and reading these, one time it struck me, just reading letter after letter and hearing people saying that they don't have any connect, you know, there's nobody responding to them. And um, I, I asked another brother who, who was in prison, I said, did it ever feel when you were writing organizations that you were like stuck on a desert island, putting a message in a bottle and throwing it out there and just hoping one day that it'll float to somebody and that one day somebody will open it and actually be able to respond? And he said, that's exactly how we felt. So every time I open those letters, it's like opening a message in a bottle and just somebody just with a hope and a desire that just wants to, that just wants to learn more about, uh, about their faith. This is where my prison outreach started. And starting getting all the letters, I started getting so many letters, you can see, even, even with my filing, it just got uh, um, too much for me to handle. And these letters, this is letters from Yusuf going back to 2003. Um, and then Yusuf's letters and correspondence with me became so much that I actually had to have uh, binders just for him. But I wanted to read one letter that, uh, and it just kind of sums up what a lot of people feel because at the end of the day, these are human beings. At the end of every one of these, these files, at the end of every one of these letters is a human being with a heart, with feelings. And um, so this brother writes, he says, Alhamdulillah, the ugliness of this prison and my imprisonment is balanced by my ties of Iman and Islam to you and other mu'minun. The harshness of my existence is softened by Allah's mercy manifesting itself through you and the mu'minun. Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. May Allah Ta'ala bless you with new and illuminating insights and guide you in piety and righteousness to success in this life and success in the akhirah. Inshallah. First and foremost, the Muslims have to understand that the brothers inside are genuinely Muslim. I think that's the biggest I issue, for, especially for them inside. They feel like the Muslims in free society don't look at them as Muslims. I think that's the biggest single thing that the Muslims need to know out here, is that you know they literally believe that the Muslims in free society don't consider them genuine, genuine or bona fide Muslims. Therefore, they don't help them. You want somebody coming back out that's still a thug or a gangbanger or revert back to his old lifestyle hustling and being a difficult neighbor to you or somebody that gets out that's generally, you know, Muslim and that has Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in their heart and they're connecting with a community that cared about them while they was in there. You see what I'm saying? Alhamdulillah, I'm trying to do the work and, you know, uh, like I said from the beginning, the last talk that I gave when I was inside was service, Urbadiya. And Urbadiya from the standpoint of to Allah, but also to humanity, the rest of humanity, you know, and I think that long as I stay in that mindset of being of service, that everything else is gonna fall into play. We are the Ansar, we, we're the helper of the people, man. And that's all we wanna do, man, is help people. That's all I ever wanna do, you know, is do the best I can to help the human being. So I think the support an organization like this would actually 
for society as a whole, not just the Muslim community, but society at large. A, a number of Muslims in prison, they refer to themselves as the forgotten believers. And so what we want to do is, is, to, is to bridge the gap between our Muslim brothers in, in prison and the community that does have concern for them if they knew about their situation. But in a lot of situations, they just don't know. And so we just want to remind them and remind them to remember their forgotten Muslim brothers and, and sisters in prison.